start talking about love, the God kind of love. And there's many different kinds of love. We're focusing on the God kind of love or agape love. And working our way through that, the one thing that <clears throat> I really want to change more and more and more, because Christian life is a growing process, the one thing I want to change more and more in my life is I want more prayers answered. It's I, I want more power happening. Now, there's an interesting, you know, we, we, we told you what the Lord told us. He said, if you, if you want to see the glory or the, the presence and the power, that's what glory means, presence and power of God manifesting. If you want to see more of that, love people, okay? So let me give you a scripture that ties in with that. If you want to see more of what God's doing, everything we get from God is by faith, right? Okay? So Galatians 5, 6. Faith operates or functions or works by love. That's agape there. That's the word agape. It's a word, the, the difference between agapeo, and if you're with your booklet, just briefly go there. We'll do a little review here. Page number five, <clears throat> agapeo. Used approximately 117 times in the New Testament. All the definitions are there. Tell me what agapeo means in a nutshell. It's the mindset or the attitude the posture we take internally that is like God, how he loves. And all the definitions are there. If you go over to the next page, page number six, you've got agape there, and you've got uh, various definitions from various sources. It splashes over into page seven. And also, by the way, I will say this. Uh, there he's on page seven, and that's the end of agape. And then you've got a bunch of scriptures there that follow that. You've all had a, you also had a bunch of scriptures that followed agapio. Those are the verses that particular Greek word shows up in. So I, I don't know if I got them all. I got 99% of them, but I might have missed one or two. But if you're looking for where does agape show up, it's in those verses. And you'll notice if you go to Galatians chapter 5, verse number 6, that's the verse I just quoted to you. Faith operates in agape love. So if we want more answers, if we want more movement of the supernatural in our life, it operates by love. The more love we're in, the more faith will operate. You can't, we can't be hate-filled, bitter, mean people, and we operate in faith. Those, those two don't go together. Agapeo is the mindset or the attitude, the posture we take internally. Agape is what? Actions. Taking what is inside and now doing it, living it. So that's what we've been talking about. We're in it a few messages now. If you go to page number eight, I want to fix something that that I discovered a typo in the booklet, and I discovered it last Sunday while I was preaching and reading the definition, and I don't know, hopefully you didn't catch it because I didn't want to confuse you because I read it and I said, that makes no sense. That's got to be wrong. And I said, well, let me go back and read it again. And I read it again and it was just as wrong. <laughs> so I just ran. You know, when you're in front of people, you don't want to stop and try to figure things out. I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what was wrong. So I just ran. Um, if you would bring page 8, the bottom, up. We were reading the definition there of phileo, which phileo, just as a brief uh, review, phileo is the kind of love that most people in the world, especially in the church, live by. It's a love where we, we're friendly to someone. We delight in them. We like them. They like us. Uh, we're desirous of preserving their life. Uh, we we want to help them. We, we find pleasure to love to do or to do with pleasure. When we do things with certain people that we love, it's, just an, it's an enjoyable day. That's phileo. That's not agape. That's phileo. We kind of confuse those two. And even the definitions, if you scroll up a little bit there, Eric, the, the 
definition for phileo. You've got phileo. It's used approximately 25 times in the New Testament. There's the Strong's number from the Strong's Concordance. And that first definition there comes from Strong's Concordance. And he's pointing out the difference between agape and phileo. Then you move down a little bit. You've got Young's Concordance, which doesn't give you much of a definition. Then you've got that one that he just shot past. It starts with to love, to be friendly to one, moves on down. That's Thera's Greek English uh, lexicon. And he gives that definition there. Well, I was in the process of reading that last Sunday. Do you happen to have that one, the old? This is... This is the new one, I think. Let me look just to make sure so I don't stick my foot in my mouth. Uh, this is the new one. Do you have the one we showed last Sunday? This would be the one, that, the one that's in most of their booklets because I have to show them what they have to change in the booklet to make this right. So it's the booklet that was being used last week. If you can bring that up. So I was reading... There it is, page 8, toward the bottom. I think you just, might, where are we at? There we are, okay. So bring that bottom paragraph all the way up, because I've got to explain this. I was reading, as to the distinction between agapio and phileo. So this is Thayer's Greek-English lexicon trying to explain this to us. The former, agapio, properly denotes a love found in admiration, veneration, esteem, but denotes an inclination prompted by sense and emotion. Okay, stop right there. I have been saying over and over, agape and agapio start with a decision, not an emotion. Scripturally, that's the definition for agape and agapio. And we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and talk about it. In other words, it says one of the first things that was said in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 is love is kind. We talked about that last Sunday. Love is kind. To be kind most of the time is a decision, mm -hmm. not an emotion. Mm -hmm. Because even those situations where somebody, I, I ran into somebody who hurt my feelings, they, they did something that was wrong, uh, I'm in a grumpy mood. It's just one of those days that have been better to stay in bed and I didn't, and I'm out and I'm prowling around now like a badger. And I'm in a grumpy mood. And something happens that I would like to take a piece of the little bit of mind I have left and give them a piece of my mind. <laughs> You've never had that, have you? <laughs> but the piece of my mind that I'm planning to give away is not very kind. <laughs> I do not feel like being kind. In fact, right at the moment, I might be angry. It's like, you know what? I got something to say to you, and I'm going to say it right now. And we're going to smack you a little bit here, you know, bring you back into reality. And what I'm going to say is not very kind. But I'm commanded to love them. No matter what the situation is, I'm commanded to love them, which means I'm commanded to treat them with kindness. At that point, that's going to take a decision on my part. I will decide to handle them in a kind manner. Whether I feel like it or not, that's not... God's kind of love doesn't go by feelings because feelings are fickle. Sometimes they feel great, sometimes they don't. God's love is constant, it's solid, it's dependable, it doesn't change with feelings. It's, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You say, well, I thought that said Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, Jesus was God, and the scripture in 1 John 4 says God is love. So Jesus is love. So love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not fickle. It doesn't, doesn't move around. Okay? So we were talking about that, <clears throat> and I kept separating. Agapeo starts with the decision, and we'll talk about that more. Phileo starts with an emotion. We feel good about someone. They feel good about us. It feels good to be around them. When we got married, it just felt so wonderful. We're in love. And then we discovered they have some little things in their life that we don't like. 
or maybe we went on to schooling or something and they didn't and now we're we're somehow we're we're separating and we're not loving them like we used to that's because we started with a feeling phileo we started with a feeling feelings change especially when he comes home with a new truck and he didn't say anything to you about it <laughs> honey look what i bought that can take a good day for a woman and turn it bad real fast especially if you can't afford it feelings change love remains because it starts with the decision now hopefully feelings follow agape love but it starts with the decision so i'm reading through this last sunday agape the former properly denotes a love in admiration veneration esteem and then it like it contradicts itself but denotes an inclination prompted by sense and emotion you're like well that makes no sense so could you give me the slides I sent to you? I'm going to show you this out of the book. There's the book I'm coming out of. There's Greek, English, lexicon of the New Testament. And this is the page, and that's how it looks. I took a picture of this and sent it in. Um, there is the definition you have. It starts with, uh, if you, if you uh, go to the top of that page, I didn't take that whole thing and put it in your booklet. Can you scroll up a little bit further? Doesn't go anymore? Okay. At the top, it gives some of these first little definitions here. And then like number three, as to the distinction between agapio and phileo, the former, by virtue of its connection with another, another form of agapio, it's, it's, it's singular or multiple or whatever, but the former properly denotes, or agapio properly denotes a love founded in admiration, veneration, esteem. Like the Latin, and now I added that in the, in, I made some new books, I added this part. Like the Latin, uh, to be kindly disposed to one, to wish well. So that's the whole thing. That's why we say the attitude of agapio is I just want the best for you. I want you to succeed. I want you to prosper. I want you to be happy. I want you to be blessed. That's all in these definitions here of agape and agapio. Okay? So we laid that out. Then it says, but phileo. I forgot to put phileo in there. It, it's a typo. I didn't intentionally forget. It just happened. But phileo denotes an inclination prompted by sense and emotion. I missed one very important word. <laughs> so if you could give us the next screen... Uh, there it goes on, gives the definition you have at the bottom of phileo. So give us the next slide there, if you would. Uh, go, the, go there. Should be one where I, I showed them what to write in. There it is. So this is what you want to do in your book on page 8, towards the bottom. You can read, agapio properly denotes a love found in admiration, veneration, and esteem. But that's the typo. Phileo denotes one that deals with emotion. So that in the future, you're not trying to explain this to someone or going back and reviewing it, and you go, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it didn't. <laughs> one word can change everything. So leave that up there just for a bit so that can be changed. So we're not going to review anymore. Let's jump in. Uh, if you have your books, go to page 23. We're going to keep reading 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8, in what's called the expanded interpretive translation. It's like the amplified translation. What it does is it takes the original words and opens up the meaning of them in the Greek. It doesn't just give you love is patient, love is kind. It, doesn't do, it gives a meaning to patience and what that really means in the Greek to be patient. So we read the first two so we're going to go a little bit deeper. We'll read over those again briefly, and then we're going to go a little bit deeper. And Eric, if you could eventually find the PowerPoint I sent to you a couple of weeks ago on hate and the Occidental thing, because I'll be needing to touch that here in a bit. So let's start. 
Love patiently and passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. Not as long as we want to be patient, but as long as patience is needed. Well, I don't feel patient anymore. That love's a choice. Stay patient. Has nothing to do with feeling. Love doesn't demand others to be like itself. Rather, it is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. Now, again, once we're through some of this, we're going to talk about boundaries. Because Christians will tend to take a statement like that and use it as, as a tool to make people do things they really shouldn't be doing. Like, for instance, it says there, love bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. You just need to do whatever you need to do for them. Nope, that's not love. You say, how do you know? Does God do that for you? See, God is love. So we always have to measure back to how does God deal with us? That's the example of how we're supposed to love ourselves and others. Okay, so let me give you a thought. You've heard me say this one before, but it's so obvious it works so good that I can't pass it up. So if you could go to page 23, Eric, and uh, bring us up on that second definition. Love doesn't demand others to be like itself. Rather, it is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what the others need it to be. So let me go back to an illustration I've used over the years because it so perfectly describes this. In my first pastorate, <clears throat> I had this question thrown at me. At the time, I probably didn't handle it as well as I should have. I'd do it better now, but that's how it goes. I had a lady who was part of the church, uh, her and her husband, uh, he was, at that point in time, I believe he was unsaved, and she was trying to get him to come and know the Lord. She was saved. She was living for God. She came to me after a Sunday morning service, and she said this. She said, my husband wants to begin uh, wife swapping. And he says, if you're a good Christian and really love me, you will do this for me. And he's got it all figured out in the bars they were going to go to and, and et cetera, okay? So she says, so if I love him, don't I have to do this for him? Okay, so go to that definition. Love doesn't, no, you're, you're moving it. There you go, right there. Love doesn't demand others to be like itself. See, he was accusing her of trying to force him to be a Christian. You're demanding me to be like you. I don't believe that's love. Rather, love is so focused, this is agape love, this is 1 Corinthians 13, love is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. If you really love me, see, guys, single guys use this on single girls all the time. Honey, if you really love me. You'll have sex with me because we're so in love. Oh, you manipulative thing. <laughs> You're just trying to get what you want. It's not really about her. But she's coming from the perspective, this lady was coming from the perspective, well, maybe if I love the guy, shouldn't I do what he needs and maybe that'll win him to Jesus? <laughs> okay, so here's the question. God loves us perfectly. He is agape love. When has he ever gone along with us doing something that he says is wrong? It's sin. But I am going to help you in this because I love you. I know it's wrong. Shouldn't be doing it. Keep doing it. You could end up losing your salvation over the whole thing. You end up in hell. But I love you so much, I'm going to do it for you anyway. Does God do that? God doesn't do that. So why do we have to do that? Amen. 
So when some of these statements are made, you can't just pull a scripture and say, there is the verse for life. You have to measure it against the whole of scripture. Amen. The New Testament specifically, because that's a covenant we're living under. You have to measure it against other places and what it says in other places. So when it says it doesn't demand others to be like itself, does God demand you to be like him? You will be like me. No, it's your choice. And there's good and bad that follows your choice, but your choice. Rather, it is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. Jesus did that. He was so focused on the fact we need salvation that he laid down his life for ours. That's love. But don't twist that into saying, I want to sin you pretty good two-shoes here. You don't want to. So I'm going to manipulate you with religious jargon to get you to do what I want, and we're going to call that love. No. No, God doesn't work like that, and we shouldn't either. Number three, goes. next one down. Love is not ambitious. Don't stop there. Right there in the Bible, it says, I shouldn't have to go to work. I'm going to stay home and do nothing. Because <laughs> love is not ambitious. And honey, I love you so much. I'm going to stay home and you go earn the money. <laughs> Don't stop there. <laughs> Read on. Love is not ambitious, self-centered, or so consumed with itself. Oh, so now he's putting ambition into a context of being self-centered and consumed with yourself. That it never thinks of the needs or desires of the other typo that, that the others possess. My mistake, it is right. Never thinks of the needs or desires that others possess. In other words, when you're making decisions about things, you have to consider the other yeah. if you love them. Love is not so self-centered and ambitious and consumed with itself. That's where the ambition lies. That it never thinks of the needs or the desires that the other person possesses. Like, for instance, coming home with a new truck or a new snowmobile or a new side-by-side. -side. And the reason you show up with it is because if you'd have discussed it, you know she would have disagreed. So now what's she going to do? Sorry, honey, I bought it. I didn't know you'd disagree like that. Right. <laughs> right. That's why you didn't discuss it with her. You know, I'm not as old as Methuselah, but I wasn't born yesterday either. <laughs> I have seen something go around the bush. I'm going to put a word in that I'm going to start using over and over here that fits this perfectly, and it's something that Christians tend to be weak in, but it, it describes every one. It's called empathy. Sympathy is when you feel bad for someone. Empathy is when you put yourself in their position and try to feel what they feel. So, honey, you went shopping at the mall, and you got excited about something, and since you were at the mall, it cost twice as much as you could have got at other place, but you got excited and you were with your friends, and you spent a few hundred dollars more than the budget allowed. Now, something that would have helped you not become so self-centered and consumed with yourself would have stopped and put yourself in your husband's position before you bought it. That's love. Or before you drove in with the new motorcycle or snowmobile. Put yourself in the wife's position and consider her side of it and what you probably agreed to in spending and everything else. Consider that before you pull the sneaky lever. Well, I don't understand why she's so angry. I mean, shouldn't a man be allowed to have a snowmobile? 
Yeah, the story probably goes a little deeper than that, don't it? (laughs) Empathy says, if I do this and I show up, what are they going to feel? That's love. I will make the decision with that knowledge rather than, well, I'm just going to do it. And I mean, once I bought it, what's he going to do about it? That's not love. That's selfishness. Pretty quiet in here. Let's move to the next one. (laughs) Love doesn't go around talking about itself all the time. Constantly exaggerating and embellishing the facts to make it look more important in the sight of others. Now, that can be interpreted as the pride way. You know, we're, we're just braggers. And I think that's one of the definitions in some of the other, in some of the other translations is, is bragging. Let's look at that from a different way. Love doesn't go around talking about itself all the time, constantly exaggerating and embellishing the facts to make it, those facts itself, look more important in the sight of others. Okay, so apply that this way. I hate this vacuum. It doesn't work anymore. It's, is he around? Is he listening? I hate this thing. I got to sweep the rug twice, three times to get it. I need a new vacuum. That's not how love expresses itself. Read it again. Love doesn't go around talking about itself all the time. I need, I want, I have to have itself. Constantly exaggerating and embellishing the facts. Honey, have you changed the the bag in it? Have you cleaned the filter? Oh, we had a decent vacuum. You wouldn't have to. (laughs) Yeah, maybe, maybe that's not right. You're kind of embellishing the facts there. To make it look like But honey, we weren't saving for a vacuum. Remember, we had talked about fill in the blank, and that's what we were going to go for. This is more important. I just gave you the facts. What I need right here, right now, is more important. Love doesn't do that. That's called manipulation. It's called whining. It's stuff like that. It's love doesn't do that. You say, well, what would love do? Sit down and have a civil, equal conversation. Her input is important as mine. My input is important as hers. We're going to work through this together, set up some priorities, and then we'll figure it out. If we find ourselves going around talking about ourselves all the time and how our needs are so big, our wants are so big, and it's all us, we have no empathy for what does it make them feel like when all I do is whine and complain and he's out there, he's working, he's, he, we started a new business, it's, he's trying to get it off the ground, it's tight right now financially. But I need all this stuff, and you're not taking care of me. Empathy, love would say, what does it make him feel like? That make any sense? Because if you put yourself in his spot, would you want to be talked to that way? No. One thing we as believers need to do before we rip our mouth open, whether it's at home or at church or at work or whatever, what I'm about to say and do, if I were them, what will this feel like? What will this look like? So let's take a simple one. So we're here or out in the foyer after church, and... uh, Let's find some people that are sitting together. We got two couples right here. And I walk up to one of them and say, 
and we're all together now in a group because you were standing side by side. We're all together in a group. Hey, you know what? I'd love to go out to dinner with you or go out for lunch. Would you go out with us? Sure. How you doing? So now empathy, love, would say, what did I just make them feel like? Well, I don't want to go out with them. Yeah, because you're in phileo love. You like these people, and you get along. Yeah, those people. I, I don't want to go out to lunch with them. Yeah, because it's all about satisfying yourself. And getting something that makes you feel good, gives you pleasure, but you're not going to really invest into someone else at your own expense. Oh, no, no. Somebody else who gets along with them can take them out. I ain't doing it. The problem here is actually not with them. It's with you. Why didn't you invite both couples? Well, we can't afford it. Tell them that. Say, hey, I want to go out to lunch with you, but I, I don't know if I can foot the whole bill. Would you go and we do it Dutch? You know, and I don't know how Dutch ever came in with this, but <laughs> we do it Dutch. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> the poor Dutch got nailed on that one. It's like, <laughs> or, <laughs> but we, you know, you pay for yours, I'll pay for mine, and invite, invite them both, rather than pushing one away. But I don't care what they feel. They find someone else. That's because you don't know how to love. Well, what am I supposed to do? If you absolutely are not mature enough yet to do it with both couples, find a way where they're separate and ask one couple. But don't hurt the feelings of the other one to get what you want. That's not love. Amen, way over there in the corner. Next one, love does not behave in a prideful, arrogant, haughty, superior, snooty, snobbish, or clannish manner. That's what puts a mouthful. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to do an experiment right now. I'm going to take a survey. Love does not behave in a prideful, arrogant, haughty, superior, snooty, snobbish, or clannish means you got your little clique, you got your little clan, clannish manner. Okay, so how many people here are fairly new to Christianity? Maybe the last three, four, five years, before that you weren't in church, you weren't serving God, whatever, but in the last three, four, five years, how many are? Okay, we've got a few. So let me ask you who are new this question and be honest. And there's others of you who are new, but you didn't raise your hand. Yeah, you don't know where I'm going, do you? That's like, <laughs> I'm not committing to nothing here. This could go any direction. So anyway, those of you who are brave enough to commit. When you were looking at Christians before you started living for God, did you picture Christians as being kind of prideful, arrogant, haughty, superior, snooty, snobbish, or even clickish, clannish? I was going to ask for a raise of hands, but I didn't even get that far. <laughs> so since we're taking a survey, and you're talkative today, last Sunday everybody was really quiet. <laughs> Sunday it's more engaged. Why did you, what, what, why did you see us as snooty or snobbish or clannish or haughty, prideful? Holier than now used to be one. Okay, so you were not understanding. Happiness, you never saw happy. I got to repeat it for the live stream. So you weren't understanding that people can actually be happy. Yeah. So you thought Christians were just faking it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I always kind of saw them a little hypocritical. And also, though, at the same time, thought I'll never live up to their standards, yeah. like what they're, what they're portraying. I'm never going to do that. Okay. You know, so I'll repeat it. <laughs> Always saw Christians a little hypocritical and that they'll never be able to live up to our standards. 
because uh, we got the standards so high, but evidently the little hypocritical is we're not living our own standards all the time. Okay? So love does not present that picture. Anybody else? What made you feel like we were doing that? Um, I used to think that Christians thought they were better than everybody else up on a pedestal and judging other people on their actions and their lifestyles. We're not. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I got to repeat that for the live stream. Probably should pass the mic around. (laughs) Always felt that Christians felt like they were better than others. They kind of put themselves up on a pedestal of this is how people should be, how they should live. And when they didn't, then we'd judge them. I always, like, I've known a couple Christians before I was one, and they always seemed to be really competitive and that they always had to be better than everyone else and that, like, they would do whatever they could to make sure that they were better than you. Okay. Christians, very competitive, tried to be better than you, and they do whatever they had to to kind of one-up you yeah. and be better than you. Wow, loving example. Great. <laughs> Richard, you're going to get in on this? Yeah, I was certain, like, what's happening today, you know, I've been with, I, I was involved with uh, with the uh, freedom thing, and that... Uh, is people pay attention to so-called Christian words rather than what's being bared, fruit that's being bared. Okay. So the concept there was, again, repeating it, is Christians say a lot of stuff, but they don't necessarily live it. Is that another way of saying that? Okay. So back to the definition. The God kind of love does not make people who are not living for God feel some of the ways that were just described. Empathy would say they don't know Jesus. If I come across this way, what are they going to think and how is that going to look to them? That's love. We as Christians tend to get so wrapped up in our righteous standards, we don't care what it affects them like. Bless God, we're going to show them. And then when people run from us rather than coming to Jesus, well, all I did was present them with the truth. Yeah, but how did you present that truth? Did you have in mind that I got to watch how I say this Because I could come off holier than thou. I could come off judgmental towards them. You know they have a problem. You know they have a weakness in an area. And you make a goofy statement like, well, these people who, and then you name their issue. These people who live like that, they deserve what they got coming. I mean, anybody in their right head wouldn't do that. I witnessed to him. <laughs> you bet you, you did. <laughs> you sure did. And what you have, they don't want. I don't understand why. Because what you presented had no empathy. You were just trying to make a point. There's a difference. Let's go one more, and then I got a different thought to throw in, and then we're done for the morning. Love is not rude or discourteous. It is not careless or thoughtless, nor does it carry on in a fashion that would be considered insensitive to others. The perfect description of the word empathy. Put yourself in their place. Love is not rude or discourteous. Put yourself in their place. It is not careless or thoughtless. Think. Well, I don't, I don't have any emotional feelings towards them that are positive anyway. That's not their fault. That's a problem with you. You got a head. It's more than to hold a cap or a hat. <laughs> Missed that part? We all have heads. It's, more to, it's, it's used for more than just holding a cap or a hat. 
or a place to hang your glasses. It's not, love is not careless or thoughtless. Think about how this is going to affect them before you dump it on them. Nor does it carry on in a fashion that would be considered insensitive to others. Let's go back to a real main playground that God wants us all to live in at some point in our life, which is marriage. Apply that. Love is not rude or discourteous. If there's something you know your spouse doesn't like, even if they need to grow in that area and everybody sees it, which that's usually our opinion, you know, you just need to grow. Well, even if that's true, you don't shove it down their throat. It's not rude. It's not discourteous. It is not careless or thoughtless. And it doesn't carry on in a manner that would seem insensitive. If you know your spouse doesn't like Domino's Pizza, when they call and say, could you pick something up on the way home? I've had a really rough day, and, and let's just, just pick something up and we'll eat it. And you know she doesn't like Domino's Pizza. But you do. So what do you do? You pick up Domino's Pizza because you love her so much. <laughs> love doesn't do that. It puts itself in her spot. And if there's something you didn't like, and you asked her to bring something home to eat, and she only brought what you don't like, wouldn't that just be like, yeah, that's my babe. She loves me. Of course not. So why do we do that kind of stuff? <laughs> why, why, why do we do that? Because we love ourselves more than them. We're in a, in a different kind of love. We're not in a, in a self-sacrificing, agape type of love. If you love Domino's Pizza, go get it. But if she, you know something she likes, go get it. And you can sit there and munch on her, your pizza while she's got a clothespin on her nose or whatever it is she doesn't like about the pizza. And she can enjoy herself. Wouldn't that be more loving? You're not sure. <laughs> Did you find that PowerPoint on hate by any chance? If you could bring that up. I want to see how it words it. <clears throat> okay, scroll down. Is there a bunch of scriptures there underneath it? Nope. Well, I let's do something. Okay, we're going to take a, a jump off the bridge now, and I'm going to try to screen mirror my iPad here up onto the screen. Okay, there we are. So let me go to mine, and I'll turn it this way. Now remember, we went over this. We talked about this. And uh, there's a number of scriptures that we talked about it coming out of 1 John. Love versus hate. Hate in the scripture is meseo. There's the Greek number for it in Strong's lexicon. So I'm going to scroll down now, and I'm going to give you some of the scriptures this shows up in. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You, sh you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's that word. We're going to go back and get the definition here in a bit. I just want to show you some of the places it's found. Contrasting love and hate. Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, and these are all agape or agapio in the word love here. Or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. Okay? 10.22. For you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. 24, verse number 9. Then they will deliver you up 
to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. He who says he is in the light but hates his brother is in darkness until now. Verse 11, same chapter. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness but does not, and does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded him. Chapter 3 of 1 John. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Chapter 3, verse 15, Anyone, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has life in him, eternal life abiding in him. And we had also looked at 1 John chapter 2, where it lists them out side by side. So I want to point this out again, because things we don't like to remember, we tend to have short memories on. The word hate. Well, I don't hate anybody. That's our definition of the word hate. Here is... The scriptural definition of that word hate that shows up in all those scriptures as well as 1 John 2 where it says it, uh, it compares hate and love. The definition in Strong's means to detest or love less. So it doesn't, it, it can go all, that's a range. It can be all the way from really, I, 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 I can't stand you, all the way over to, well, I like you, but I just don't like you as much as others. Uh, it also talks about to hate or pursue with hatred, to detest. Now let's go to the Thayer's in, uh, definition. Not a few interpreters have attributed the signification to love less, to postpone in love or esteem, or to slight someone. I don't hate them, I just didn't go out of my way for them. Through oversight of the circumstance, so let me read it again. Not a few of the interpreters, so people who are interpreting or, or trying to say what is the real meaning in the Greek of that word hate. Not a few. So a whole bunch of them have attributed the signification to loving less. Not all out, I despise you, but to love less, to postpone in love. Well, when you get your act together, then I'll love you. Or to slight them. Through oversight of the circumstance, notice this quote, that the Orientals, in accordance with their greater excitability, so <clears throat> Orientals, they're using a group of people who live on earth, Far East people, Asian people, that realm, Orientals. Have you ever noticed in a grocery store or in the mall or whatever, if you have a group of Orientals, especially the ladies, nothing against them, it's just how their culture is, they are extremely excitable. When something happens and they shift their language into gear, which is, and you're going, how can you even understand that? And they get loud and they're, they're very expressive. That's not wrong. That's who they are, Okay. So they're using culture as an example here of what their point is. The Orientals, in accordance with their greater excitability, are want, or they want to both to feel and profess love and hate. So in other words, what they're saying is because of the culture and the way they do things and say things, when you're around an Oriental, they will tell you how they feel, whether they love you or hate you. They'll just put it right on the table and you deal with it. Okay? Where we, Occidentals, and those of us who've gone over this already, you know who Occidentals are, so shh. Don't say anything. Occidentals, with our cooler temperament, feel and express nothing more than interest in or disregard or indifference. Occidentals, notice who Occidentals are. Look it up in your dictionary. People of European descent. We're not quite as excitable there, top right line, as the Orientals. We have the cooler temperament. Therefore, we're not going to just plain come out and tell you we don't like you. We are going to treat you with less interest 
or we might even be indifferent to you and just kind of disregard you. I don't hate you. I just, I just don't have any feelings toward you that are good. Thayer's Greek English lexicon says, showing, just showing disinterest or disregarding and being indifferent is the definition to that word hate. So when Jesus said, you've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, he said, but that's wrong. He said, I'm telling you, you need to love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who treat you with indifference. And remember, it's a range. It can go from totally, de they detest you, over to they're just not interested in you. The church tends to live in the, we're just not interested in you side. Because if we've been in church long enough, we know it's not right to just flat out hate somebody. I hate you. You disgust me. You are the most despicable thing that God has ever created, in my opinion. I just hate you. Oh, no, we can't do that, because that's wrong. So we just ignore them. We just show no interest in their life. We disregard. Just, it's me inviting them out right in front of them. Well, I don't hate them. Well, according to Scripture, you just showed them hate because you had no interest in them. You just disregarded how they would see and think and feel about this whole thing. That, Scripture says, is hate for those of us who are Occidentals, <laughs> which is probably most of us. If we're going to love, if, if scripturally disregarding people or being disinterested in them is hate, if we're going to love them, God's kind of love, we have to be interested, don't we? Well, I'm not interested. That's your problem. You need to get that fixed. Because believe it or not, if you measure against God, he's interested in everybody. Well, he's God, I'm not. Yeah, and we're supposed to try to grow to be more like him. How can we, here's my application for the morning, empathy. Here's empathy. How can we go to the same church for years, never have enough interest in that side to even talk to them? much less take them out to lunch or invite them over or get to know them. We're not interested. You hate them, scripturally. So when you stand before God, he's going to say, why did you hate them? Well, I didn't hate them. I was just kind of indifferent towards them. That's hate. Because true love does not have the right to be indifferent toward anybody. True love says, I want the best for everybody and we find a way that's the that's agapio that's the posture and we find a way to engage that in action he says, oh i'm one person i can't take everybody out in the world you don't have to follow the holy spirit he'll point the ones out yeah. well that's what worries me yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> he's going to point somebody out you don't want to do it now it's your opportunity to grow thank you for that corner <laughs> if it weren't for Dean, it just gets quiet at those kind of times. <laughs> I know you're thinking, and that's okay. Think. The point of learning to just love people comes to as a simple thing as, I am interested in you. Who are you? I would like to know, and I know I got time restraints, and I know I'm raising little children and, and stuff, but my posture is this side would like to get to know that side. You in the middle don't count. We don't care. No, just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> 
We want to get to know each other. We're interested. You say, I don't have the time restraints. I got time restraints. I can't, I can't get to know everybody. That's okay. That's the agape, living it out part. You do that by the Spirit, what the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. But your heart is a posture of agape. I'm interested in everybody. I'd love to hear their story. I would love to get to know everybody. And the Holy Spirit will go, how about that one? Or them? And we go, yes. We go, yes. We're going to get to know them because I felt the Lord pointed them out. We're going to get to know them. Come on, wake up. We're at the end. So your assignment is, see, it's not good just talk about this and do nothing. Your assignment is, in, in the next few minutes, the next day, the next week, we won't go any further than that because then you'll forget. But sometime between this moment and next Sunday, Show some interest in somebody you don't know. Be so brave as to even want to get together with them. <laughs> some are in and others are going... Let's learn how to love people. You say, why should I? Because faith operates by love, and the, the manifestation of God's power and presence will flow more when we love than when we don't. So to kind of get over to where God wants us to be, we have to learn to do this. Do you need prayer to pull this off, or are you, are you okay? <laughs> If you're okay, I'll just thank you for coming and dismiss you and give you the assignment. That yeah, seems like most of you are okay. All right, thank you for coming. Have an awesome day. You've got your assignment.